The Honorable Olivia Grange, CD, MP, Minister of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport. Mr. Vivian Crawford, Executive Director, Institute of Jamaica. Mr. James Masolomon, Chairman, Council of the Institute of Jamaica. Council members of the Institute of Jamaica. Mr. Bernard Janke, Acting Director, Liberty Hall, The Legacy of Marcus Garvey. Dr. Nathaniel Duncan, Director of African Studies and Research Institute, Associate Professor of History, Queens College, City University, New York. All our viewers watching live stream on the ACIJ JMB YouTube channel and those from CIS CUNY and other university communities. The warmest Jamaican welcome as we celebrate the 134th anniversary of the birth of our first national hero, the right excellent Marcus Mazayo Garvey. Daddy Marcus, as he's affectionately called, was a nationalist, activist, philosopher, and visionary. He was a gift to not only Jamaica, the Caribbean, but to all African peoples. The right excellent Marcus Garvey promoted love of the motherland, Africa. His writings emphasized love, pride, and confidence amongst black peoples, regardless of their location, age, and gender. This staging, the 12th staging of the annual Marcus Mazayo Garvey Lecture, seeks to engender the intellectual and political contributions of black women and focuses on the legacies of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, UNIA Women. We are very pleased to have Dr. Nathaniel Duncan as our special guest who will present on the theme, We Build Forever, the Legacies of the UNIA Women. Please note that during the lecture, Questions can be sent by email to lhannualgarveylecture at gmail.com or they can be submitted through the chat on the YouTube channel and these will be read and addressed during our question and answer section after Dr. Duncan's presentation. We will now welcome Mr. Vivian Crawford, Executive Director of the Institute of Jamaica to deliver greetings. Moderator, Dr. Leslie Gale Atkinson Swaby, Mr. Stephen Golding, and Mr. Delroy Morgan, co chairman of the Board of African Caribbean Institute of Jamaica, Jamaica Member Bank, and other members of the board, including Mr. Bernard Janke, Director, Associate Professor Dr. Natanya Duncan, our guest lecturer, members of staff of Liberty Hall the legacy of Marcus Garvey, including Miss Faith Anderson, research officer, other members of staff of the Institute of Jamaica, guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. It is my privilege, pleasure and duty on behalf of the Institute of Jamaica to offer greetings at this 12th annual Marcus Messiah Garvey lecture coordinated by the team from Liberty Hall, the legacy of Marcus Garvey. Highest commendation to Mr. Bernard Janke and the staff of Liberty Hall for this function, especially at a time such as this, when the world has to cope with the challenges of COVID-19. Right excellent Marcus Messiah Garvey would want us to affirm, press along regardless in spite of the Middle Passage, enslavement, cholera, Spanish flu, hurricanes, etc., etc., we have a story to tell. Special recognition to our lecturer, Associate Professor Dr. Natanya Duncan from New York. Little did she know that he, in whose steps she trod, she would one day be speaking in his honor at this space. We remember with gratitude the contribution of right excellent Marcos Messiah Garvey to nation building. We remember Dr. Donna McFarlane, late director of this space from 2003 to 2016. Just last June, 
we laid to rest Mr. Everest Harding, who supervised the restoration of Liberty Hall in 2003, and who proved it is not true that Rome was not built in a day because it was a government contract. Mr. Harding delivered on time and below budget. Most Honorable Edward Siaga must be remembered for his vision in saving this space from the auction block. The theme we build forever, the legacies of UNI women, echoes the popular saying in role playing that if man is the earthly head of the house, woman is the neck, for the head cannot move without the neck. So greetings, greetings, greetings. Let the lecture begin. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. All protocols are observed. So my name is Faith Anderson, and I will be introducing the guest lecturer. Natanya Duncan is the director of Africana Studies and a research institute at Queens College City, University of New York, and an associate professor of history. A historian of the African diaspora, her research and teaching focuses on the global freedom movements of the 20th and 21st century. Duncan's research interest includes construction of identity and nation building amongst women of color, migrations, color and class in the diasporic communities, and the engagements of intellectuals throughout the African diaspora. Her forthcoming University of Illinois Press book, An Efficient Womanhood, Women and the Making of the United Universal, sorry, Negro Improvement Association focuses on the distinct activist strategies enacted by the women in the UNIA, which Duncan calls an efficient womanhood. Following the ways of women in the UNIA, following the ways in which the women in the UNIA scripted their own understanding of Pan-Africanism, Black nationalism, and constructions of diasporic Blackness, the work traces the blending of nationalist and gendered concerns amongst women known and those who are lesser known in the Garvey movement. Duncan's other publications include works that explore the leadership models of women, UNIA women, and include Know in Charge of the American Field, Meme Demina, and Charting the UNIA's New Course in 76 King Street, Volume 3. Henrietta Vinton Davis, the Lady of Race in the Journal, Journal of New York History. Laura Kofi and the Reversed Atlantic Experience in the American South and the Atlantic World, University of Florida Press 2013. Most recently, she co-edited a special volume of the Caribbean Women and Gender Studies Journal. Gender and Anti-Colonialism in the Interwar Caribbean, published December 2018. The award-winning 12-article volume examines the political ferment of the interwar period, 1918 to 1939, tracking how gendered conceptions of rights, respectability, leadership, and belonging informed anti-colonial thought and praxis. Rather than constructing a singular narrative of Caribbean anti-colonialism, Duncan et al. contend that we grapple with a varied political vision and modes of resistance that animated critiques of colonial rules attending at once to place specific strategies and to shared regional agendas. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Dr. Natanya Duncan, or guest lecturer for the 12th annual Marcus Mazaya Garvey Lecture. Good morning, and a special thank you to Sister Anderson for a wonderful introduction, to Brother Jenki and the other staff members here at Liberty Hall Memory Bank. I want to thank all of you for agreeing to have me um, for the 12th annual Marcus Garvey Lecture, and for also allowing me to take us 
in a little different direction today as we not only focus on the legacy of Mr. Garvey, but his brilliance in fostering, co-fostering a space that enabled women to explore activist strategies that in, allowed us to have the UNIA still intact to this day. I argue in my larger work that it is actually women who, on the ground, through grassroots activisms, engage in orchestrating and promoting the UNIA and ensuring its legacy into the 21st century. So today, We Build Forever the Legacies of the UNIA Women is a talk that is actually inspired by my witness of the 2012 uh, 50th anniversary of Jamaica in Jamaica National Stadium, where the Black Cross nurses of the Harmony Division marched out carrying the red, black, and green flag, the Black Nationalist flag, flanked by um, a legion of the Universal African Motor Corps. And I was really taken aback by the presence of the BCN at that event and to see them carrying the flag up to the rostrum to hear the UNIA's, um, the national anthem of the UNIA being sung. And then I realized that they had not been fully incorporated into the story, into the narrative of what we know about the Universal Negro Improvement Association. And so in that vein today, I begin my talk with Amy Ashwood Garvey, Marcus Garvey's first wife, who is attributed as the co-founder of the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League. The two were briefly married um, between 1919 and 1922, but their relationship started in 1914 as Garvey witnessed Amy Ashwood giving a, a debate in which she won and was impressed with her speaking prowess. The organization actually received its launching through the financial assistance of Amy Ashwood and her family when she borrowed the money from her mother's purse to print this first set of flyers for the initial meeting. The organization took life when Garvey declared her secretary and she declared him president. Amy Ashwood was a Pan-Africanist, a black feminist, a playwright, and a restaurateur. Her efforts to increase the global awareness of the Universal Negro Improvements Association's aims can be considered a part of the vast impact that it came to have. And so how did she come to do this? And what was it that she did as her practical strategy, her everyday strategy that enabled this moment that we now have today. I propose that Amy Ashwood was actually the arbiter of a form of activism called efficient womanhood that is predicated on partnership as praxis, intergenerational and peer mentorship, and bridge building. Five years after the UNIA was incorporated with a constitution that allowed one member, one vote, which essentially meant that women in the organization were fully enfranchised, that women in the UNIA were able to vote for elected officers and run for elected office before women were enfranchised in the United States, in Great Britain, or any other alleged supposed developed country. In the UNIA, women engaged in partnerships with men, with other women, with like-minded um, organizations and groups that shared the common goal of black autonomy, black economic independence, and progressive educational standards for black children worldwide. One of the ways in which 
um, Amy Ashwood helped ensure this was that at the original incarnation of the UNIA, in its aims and objectives, she ensured that it specified that education goals for boys would be equivalent to the education goals for girls, meaning that the curriculum girls received would not be much different than the curriculum boys received. Because essentially, Amy Ashwood and Marcus Garvey were black nation builders. And they believed collectively that both men and women had a part to contribute. Now, Amy Ashwood has become known throughout Pan-African circles for her work with the West African Student Union and the, colored, the League of Colored Peoples in London, England. She also established a women's center in London, England for Afro and Asian women. Intergenerational and peer mentorship through Amy Ashwood's lens meant modeling the ways in which you felt people could have opportunity. She also served as a bridge builder through the use of her restaurant, the Florence Mills, located in London, England. She raised funds to help students, uh, West African students and Caribbean students get through school, pay their tuition, and also provided a place for them to live above the restaurant. And so we'll be looking at UNIA women today as institution builders. Beyond the UNIA itself, women created specific spaces and extended authorities ascribed to them in the Constitution. Now, the UNIA's Constitution did specify that there would be a woman's auxiliary. And many scholars read this as a gendered division. But in actuality, UNIA women took the opportunity to see the separate space as a sacred space through which they began to plan, edit, and even revise some of the strategies of the organization to better meet the needs of the day. The efficient womanhood of the UNIA, essentially in practice, is practical politics that is considered a radical politics. UNIA women are institution builders who believe that all activists deserve credit for the work they do. They also engage in the globalization of black women's conversations on civil and social rights. The granddaughter of Carveyites, Tarana Burke, founder of the Me Too movement, is a classic example of the extension of the efficient womanhood framework, recognizing a need in our community for open conversations on self-care and managing abuses and speaking about abuses um, in the corporate world and even in our families and intimate relationships, she established this organization and is now moving it toward uh, self-care and mental health issues for the black community worldwide. Jessica Huntley, self-described British Afro-Guyanese writer, publisher, social justice reformer, established the Bogle Overture Press in London, England, and grew up in a Garveyite atmosphere. These organizations, uh, institutions that these women built in the 20th and 21st century, are indications of how the UNIA efficient womanhood has stood the test of time. Now, where do we find the seeds or the groundings of the efficient womanhood strategy in the Negro World newspaper. Now, many scholars argue that the Negro World newspaper was simply Marcus Garvey's mouthpiece. He was always on the front page, and there was really not much to the paper. However, a closer reading of the, of the Negro World reveals that there are many places in which women appear as writers, as editors, as contributors to the conversation on black nationalism. And we see here in 1932, Madame Demina, who later became Madame Demina Aiken, took hold of the UNIA as officer in charge of the American field and took center stage on the front page of the newspaper. Now, where do we find the women's voices in the Negro world, the People's Forum, the news and views of the UNIA. A column called Kitty Corner 
that was specifically dedicated to having children write in poetry and short essays. The Spanish section where Spanish poets submitted their work. We have the um, health notes of the Universal African Black Cross Nurses. Um, authored by registered nurse Clara Morgan and the weekly magazine and feature section. Now, often people limit their understanding or their interaction on women in the UNIA to considerations of the second Mrs. Amy Garvey, Amy Jakes Garvey, who was the editor of Our Women and What They Think, also served as associate editor of the Negro World, is known as Garvey's Chronicler, partnered with white supremacist Ernest Servia Cox and Senator Theodore Bilbo to sponsor a Back to Africa or Liberia bill, and became friends with Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois. Now, part of the efficient womanhood strategy of partnership is that women engage with persons who share like-minded ideas. It's not about who you like. It's not about who you agree with every day. It's about the goal. And so in blending their nationalist and their gendered concerns, efficient women in the UNIA often engage in what we would consider to be somewhat contradictory or controversial relationships and partnerships with the intent of achieving black autonomy at the end of the equation. I also want to call your attention as we go through um, the presentation to the photos of the women. I am particular about the pictures of UNIA women that I share publicly. Too often we have the idea that radical women must dress and look a certain way. However, I found in my research that UNIA women were actually very much so in step with the period that they lived in, fashionable, and sort of redefined for themselves what was respectable politics. So here we have our women and what they think in 1925. Often, many scholars end their conversation on women in the movement by looking at the brief period, the two-year period of our women and what they think. However, in keeping with the efficient womanhood strategy of intergenerational mentorship and peer mentoring, we find that the Our Women and What They Think page was actually revised and remixed by the daughter of Mamie Demina, Bernice Demita, and we find a column called Womanly Ways that began in 1929 and ran until the close of the Negro world in 1933. Now, in talking about partnership and mentorship, I would be remiss if I did not enter Lady Henrietta Vinton Davis into the conversation. It is important to note, um, because I see this on the internet a lot, and um, I lovingly look at it and make comments each time. Henrietta Vinton Davis was a Shakespearean actress and orator who was 56 years old when she joined the Universal Negro Improvement Association. She was the daughter of middle class AME Baptist minister and his wife, and really, in the Northern American context, she belonged, she should have been in the Black Women's Club movement. Instead, she chose the UNIA. And she chose the UNIA particularly because she had an appreciation for the love of self and the love of self color that Garveyism purported. She was critical of the color consciousness of the 1920s and found that the UNIA provided a more wholesome space. She was not a nurse. However, she did assist in organizing the Black Cross Nurses. She is not the founder of the Black Cross Nurses. The Black Cross Nurses were founded, as we will see in a later slide, by Isabella T. Anderson of Trinidad and um, British Trinidad and Clara Morgan. She served as the second vice president of the Black Star Line and was on the contingency commission to, of the UNIA to Liberia.
Now, as much as Marcus Garvey went to trial for overselling stock and was accused of mail fraud for overselling stock to the Black Star Line, upon closer examination, I found that many of the, the stock certificates were actually signed by Henrietta Vinton Davis. People were impressed with her, believed in her, trusted her, and so she became Garvey's right hand and left hand. And often when he was questioned in public about the Black Star Line, he would defer or ask that person's weight until Lady Davis was present because she would be the one to best inform. So there was a, a sense of power and authority that was ascribed to Henrietta Vinton Davis, not just by Mr. Garvey, but by the membership itself. Now, in keeping with the mentor model in the UNIA, Madam Mamie Leona Turpo Demina became the protege of Lady Davis. Lady Davis traveled throughout Latin America and the Spanish-speaking Caribbean in order to raise awareness of the UNIA, establish branches, and sell, and sell stock to the BSL, the Black Star Line. Again, here we have history playing games with us. Madame Demina was actually born in New Orleans, Louisiana. She married a Nicaraguan and was granted citizenship as such at the time that was the, the policy. You got married, you take the citizenship of your husband. When she decided that the husband was no longer necessary, she determined to have her daughter born in the Panama Canal Zone, giving her some levity in terms of what type of citizenship she could claim. She then made her way to the United States with her daughter and began serving as a Spanish translator in the UNIA to Lady Davis. Later, she would befriend the champion of the Garvey Must Go campaign in America, Adolph Philip Randolph, who was the um, benchmark of the Brotherhood of the Sleeping Car Porters, which was the largest black labor organization to exist at the time. Actually, it was the only one. Um, because she believed that Mr. Randolph's audience and his agenda best served the UNIA's agenda at the time. When the Negro world folded, Madame Demina started a second newspaper as publisher entitled The Ethiopian World. During her time in the UNIA, she married um, two more times. The last time to a Jamaican man named Percival Aiken. She and Mr. Aiken cemented their marital relationship in 1936, and Madame Demina became Madame Aiken of Kingston, Jamaica, and was involved in helping to shape political parties and encourage women to run for political office. Now, if you look at the picture, I'm just going to go back one second, of Madame Demina. One of the reasons people are readily and easily able to believe that she may have been Nicaraguan by birth and not by marriage was her facial features. And of course, she never took any time to correct anybody. True efficient womanhood status, you use what is working for you at the time. So in order to ensure that she could travel the world and not be questioned for her political activities, she maintained a Nicaraguan passport and a United States passport and used them selectively to claim identities other than pure American blackness or Caribbean blackness to get through um, governing bodies that would have wanted to limit her uh, movement. And so in looking at Mamie Demina, I then had to begin to grapple with the poets of the Negro world who had lauded her and Henrietta Vinton Davis in verse. In examining the poets, I came across a woman named Ethel True Dunlap, who was the most prolific of the poets of the Negro world and started the UNIA's literary society. Now, 
Many scholars report that Ethel True Dunlap is a mixed race woman. And there are poems taught from various poets, um, including J.R. Casimir and um, others who talk about her yellow skin. As a matter of fact, J.R. Casimir um, and um, Charles Estes, another poet from Canada, J.R. Casimir is from, the Dominic from Dominica, talk about sitting at the Yellow River and soaking in all it had to pour into them, that they were actually motivated by Ethel True Dunlap's verse and captivated by her person. So I wanted to know more about her life because I could only find her in the Negro world. And many of the women that I have encountered, including the 66 um, poets I've studied, only exist in the Negro world. She established something called what I call diasporic back chat, which was a global conversation amongst poets in the UNIA that took place in the Negro World newspaper. She did this by actually writing a poem that said, write to me, O sons and daughters um, of Ethiopia. Tell me of your woes in Miami. Let me know what is happening in Alabama. Please bless me with the wind of Barbados. And so she called out to the UNIA to write to her, and they did. And she wrote back. And they wrote in verse in a way that allowed us, if when we put it together in sequence, to see that there's an actual conversation taking place, which I've dubbed diasporic back chat. And so in looking at the back chat, I realized that consistently, while I saw pictures in the Negro world of other poets and saw pictures of them in other newspapers, I could find no photo of Ethel Dunlap. And it became very, very, very annoying and frustrating to see how well she had written, how much she had written. She was even publishing in a Japanese magazine called The Young East, but no photo. I then started looking for her birth certificate, her death certificate, her mama name, her daddy name, anybody I could find that could tell me something about this woman. Well, I found her death certificate first, and in 1942, it appears that she died at her own hand. Then when I started to backtrack to look for her in the US Census, and as you can see, when she signed her poem, she also provided her address. Many of the poets in the UNIA actually provide their address at the end of the poem. And this is how I say they cement the diasporic back chat. Although they were being surveilled by several um, government agencies in the, in the Caribbean, um, in Great Britain, by Spain, by France, the United States, they still sign their address because they were just bold like that, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so I started looking at where she lived, who she lived with, who else was in the house, and found that Ethel True Dunlap was listed as a white woman consistently in census data in the United States. And so then it made me begin to think a little bit more about this concept of partnership in the UNIA that here Ethel True Dunlap, who authored poems, I am, white in, I am White in Color Only, I Love the Red, Black, and Green Flag, essentially came to present herself as a connection or a connector, a bridge builder between audiences that she felt needed a voice, that she could present their sentiment to and as someone who spoke to her own community and called them to question for their behavior. And so Ethel True Dunlap's work led me then to question the presence and idioms associated or questions associated with Princess Laura Adakor Kofi. Now Princess Kofi was assassinated at a Miami UNIA meeting on March 3rd, 1928. Why I became fascinated with her in relation to Ethel True Dunlap and the death of Ethel True Dunlap was that I began to question, were these women respected? Were these women understood? 
Did these women pose a threat inside and outside of the organization to the extent that they had audiences who had multiple motives for listening to them? And that actually happened to be the case in Laura Adekor Kofi's situation. She approached Mr. Garvey while he was in the Atlanta Penitentiary to warn him about some of his male associates. At the same time, she was signing up people for the UNIA, and in a three-month period between Tampa and South Florida, specifically um, as far as Homestead, Florida, she signed up 3,000 people. And these are dues-paying members and the financial records, because I know somebody out there is going to want to know, they are at the Schomburg. You can see them um, at the Schomburg Library. Um, and they are dated in 1927 and 1928, between the months of November and January. Um, by February of 1928, she is being touted as persona non grata. And essentially, she gets that status because she is now pulling audiences in ways that black pastors and other Garveyite leaders, male leaders at the moment, are unable to. Laura Kofi also had her own vision of a back to Africa movement, a repatriation, that did not include Liberia. Laura Kofi essentially argued, why go to Liberia? It's already built up. The people there have established their infrastructure, they have their government. Let's go somewhere that still needs to be developed because amongst us, we have carpenters and masons and um, electricians. We have farmers. We have people amongst us who can build an infrastructure and build that independent nation state that can serve as the home for diasporic Africans who wish to return. Of course, her conversation about the Liberia plan was considered controversial in the UNIA. And so from there, she, dis she had begun to establish the African Universal Church. And in the African Universal Church, she simply remixed and adopted the aims and objectives of the UNIA, much in the same way that was that occurred with the Ethiopian Peace Movement and Midi Maud Lena Gordon. Women who found dissatisfaction with Mr. Garvey and the male leadership of the organization never actually abandoned the UNIA ideology. Efficient women actually make the distinction between the individual and the philosophy. As a result, they were able to refashion the UNIA program wherever they were living over time and essentially ensured the legacy of Marcus Garvey and the UNIA into the 21st century. Now, we see that Laura Kofi is a woman in white. And we often hear about these women in white who are parading in Harlem, who are parading in Atlanta, who are parading in Virginia. And we are given historically the idea that the Blacks Cross Nurses Auxiliary was simply that, women in white uniforms marching down the street. Well, not exactly. They had a much fuller profile and agenda. The Black Cross Nurses of the Universal Negro Improvement Association was established officially in 1921, but had actually begun under the auspices of Isabella T. Lawrence and Clara Morgan in 1919 in Harlem, New York. And because they recognized that during, um, for example, the tuberculosis epidemic um, and other flu outbreaks, that there were no healthcare facilities readily available to assist black people, whether living in urban or rural centers, it was necessary in order to ensure black autonomy, black self-help, that 
the organization have a division that spoke to the health and well-being of its membership. And so these women were trained nurses under the gui guidance of black doctors. It had an all-female hierarchy. Men could join as honorary members, but they could not hold office in the BCN. And they actually developed a manual of sorts that they circulated in the Negro world. And we have two examples here of one, the Ethics of Nursing by Isabella Lawrence, registered nurse, and the Universal African Black Cross's Child Welfare Department written a column where people could write in and ask questions about childcare, marital relations, running a home, and in many cases, the UNIA Black Cross nurses were able to combine traditional or homeopathic medicine remedies with the current, at the time, medical advances, scientific medical advances that were being made. Many black communities responded more readily to them um, as care providers, essentially because they knew who the women were and trusted their judgment, but then also because they had proximity and access to them in ways that they did not have to other government-based healthcare structures. Another aspect of the Universal Negro Improvement Association's Efficient Womanhood is the Universal African Motor Corps. Now, the UNIA, in its rhetoric and its ideology, determined that it would be ready to defend a united Africa. And in order to do so, both men and women would need to be trained. And so we have the all-female paramilitary auxiliary that was disciplined and taught automotive driving and car repair. The highest rank in the Universal African Motor Corps was that of Brigadier General. They taught women how to shoot. They practiced shooting after church on Sundays, and this was one of the things that sort of bothered Laura Kofi. You just got off the choir stand, and you have praised the Lord and caught the Holy Spirit, and now you are standing here with a gun in your hand shooting cans. Um, conducting target practice. It just didn't seem to her that the two went together. And of course, though, there were those that argued, you know, that in the Christian faith, you know, they say onward Christian soldiers, right? And so they considered themselves the soldiers of the UNIA. Now, I often get this question from my students and from colleagues, well, is the UNIA, I mean, like, how long did it last? Is it still going on? And much to my joy and God bless Facebook, someone put up in response to a question I asked, a picture of Sister Ruth Smith, who's a veteran member of the Universal African Motor Corps. She was the driver of Mamie Demina. This picture was taken in the early 1980s. Um, she is now deceased, of course. But I was most impressed to see how happily and proudly she wore her African Motor Corps uniform. That the uniform was worth preserving and donning on a regular basis for the Sunday evening meetings that she attended. And that this uniform for her was not just a way of recapturing an activity from her youth, but a symbol that she proudly wore publicly so that she could engage others in knowing more about the UNIA. And so she invoked the intergenerational and peer mentorship model of efficient womanhood every Sunday when she put on her uniform. So now we see that the UNIA women have established institutions within the organization, and in latter periods they go on to establish independent organizations on their own and serve as elders, mentors, and moderators in supporting them. So now where is efficient womanhood in the 21st century? 
And I posit that much of what we see occur in the groundswell for Black Lives Matter in particular, which is established by three women of color, comes from the efficient womanhood model. In addition to that, in our current moment, efficient womanhood for me is symbolized in Karen Jean Pierre, the White House press secretary, Sister Sasha Johnson, who is still fighting for her life in London after an assassination attempt. It is, em it is emphasized in the attempt of solidarity shown despite the rules. And this is what you and I women did beautifully. They made sure they rewrote the rules to suit the situation and the time that they were in. And so Luciana Alvarado of Costa Rica at the 2021 Olympics with the Black Power sign in solidarity with Black Lives Matters and in salute to Sister Sasha Johnson. Then we have our mogul entrepreneur, Robin Rihanna Fenty, who is also one of the more silent but generous partners who continuously uses her social capital and her money to support endeavors for black women. And then we have Dr. Kizumika S. Corbett, the COVID-19 immunologist who is fighting to keep black people and all people alive during this pandemic. And then we find that even in this moment where we are still having to explain the explain about why my shade is different than yours. We have Zhang Fifi, the Chinese Congolese singer who celebrates her blackness, her Asianness, and sees them as being in sync and in one accord. And so efficient womanhood in the 21st century. It's about your dress. It's about your hair. It's about your profile, it's about your swag, it's about how you carry yourself and how you choose to define what is going to be your path and your agenda toward the aim and the goal of black autonomy. And so like Shelley Ann Fraser Price, at the, who represented Jamaica at the 2021 Olympics, it's wear your colors as your hair and run as fast as you can. And so I close this talk today and thank you so much for your time with me with a photo of Amy Ashwood Garvey dressed in her kente, sitting quite satisfactorily, looking out amongst us and saying, well done. And thank you for the space that you have taken up. I encourage you all to take up the baton of the women of the UNIA and carry their legacy beyond the 21st century. They were institution builders. They believed in constructive partnerships that served their aims. They provided mentorship for one another and for those that would come after them. And they were bridge builders who used their social capital and their wealth towards promoting black autonomy. My name is Dr. Natanya Duncan. I'm the granddaughter of Brenda Camila Walker Duncan, of St. Anne, Jamaica, and Alexandria Butler Anderson of Clarendon. And I am a child of the diaspora. I thank you for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Duncan. That was an excellent presentation. I actually took so much notes, I ran out of paper. <laughs> um, I, I feel that we are truly, well, this was before I found that you were Jamaican, so welcome home. Um, that we are really Pan-African sisters because we both came wearing our Pan-African colors, red, black, and green you know it was so unconscious um, and it is definitely a beautiful moment well there have been lots of comments um greetings from as far as brazil from flavio rude and many people sending congratulations and 
how proud that they're celebrating the legacies of UNIA women with you. And um, one of the first questions I wanted to ask you, was there a particular moment or event or reason that inspired your research on um, the nation building activities of black women? Thank you so much um, for that question, yes. I actually started this uh, ooh, 27 years ago as an undergraduate student at Clark Atlanta University as a part of the UNCF Mellon Mays program. And I was interested at the time in doing a comparative study between women in the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and the Universal Negro Improvement Association. In doing that research, I found a, a newspaper clip that announced the assassination of Laura Kofi. I immediately realized that while the women of the NAACP were interesting, ain't nobody over there died. And so it was then incumbent to me, or the next step was to find out why was Laura Kofi murdered? Why did someone find her to be so much of a threat? What was she doing? What was she saying? And then I found out that money she raised was used to buy land um, in Jacksonville, Florida, to establish a separate space called Adorcaville, and that she was actually promoting black home ownership in 1928, when banks weren't giving loans to black people for homes. And that is what took me on this path. Oh, thank you. Um, I have another question from um, Shanette Garrett Scott. And she says, great talk. Given the UNIA's emphasis on racial dis destiny and birthing of a nation, did the UNIA Nurses Corps share reproductive health and birth control information with women members? And did they have instruction and or offer assistance such as doulas for new mothers? Thank you so much for that question, Sister Scott. Um, the Black Cross nurses in their um, health talks and in the column that was authored by Clara Morgan provided birthing care instructions, prenatal care instructions. There were midwives amongst the BCN. There were women who um, were both trained midwives and women who had inherited the midwife practice from their mothers. The BCN also engaged in conversations publicly with women about reproductive activities and the choice to have children. Now, unlike other organizations of the period, there was no moderating in the UNIA as to whether or not you should have a child because you are financially or intellectually capable. Now, this did take a different look based on where you were in the organization because the UNIA's beauty was that it had sort of an elastic clause, that you applied the ideology to the circumstance and the geography where you were located. So in Belize, for example, um, they had a BCN that actually promoted a very skewed or tapered down uh, reproductive ideology that said women who have, were not educated, women of a certain age, women of a socioeconomic background should not have children. Whereas in the wider UNIA sphere, if you could have a child, you were encouraged to do so because what is a nation without its children? And the UNIA spent a great deal of time under Mamie Demina's leadership in particular in creating spaces to serve children, one of which was the Kitty Corner News Column. It also established Liberty University on the grounds of Baptist College in Virginia. The organization actually bought Baptist College and opened what we would consider to be an all-age school for UNIA children. And parents actually boarded their children out to go to Liberty University. Thank you, Dr. Duncan. Um, in continuing with the role of the Black Cross nurses, and forgive my bias, my grandmother was a nurse. She was in the first batch of nurses ever trained in Jamaica. Um, 
I found it interesting that you mentioned that they used both homopathic and contemporary medicine practices. Is, is this an extension of us as indigenous peoples, African peoples, where we cannot separate from the, the natural medicinal uh, values and benefits? Thank you so much for that question. And it's an important one because in scripting who the UNIA believed themselves to be, they actually attempt, they actually attempt to re-script or re-graft the way we look at Africa itself and traditional African practices. And so as a result, they engage in homeopathic medicine practices and write them down and publish them in the Negro world as a way of credentializing the potency and applicability of these remedies. And so you find um, that there are examples of bush teas uh, in the Negro world, of salves from the American South that are used for whooping cough, skin rash, um, how to break a baby's fever, etc., as well as a con conversations on the uses of flora and fauna in promoting health and virility. So a number of people were very fascinated when you mentioned the universal African um, motor corps, especially the paramilitary um, arm. And, you know, I found it so interesting um, because to me it was reminiscent of the Dahomey women warriors. You know, a lot of people, just because of um, Black Panther, you know, it's become very popularized. But those who know African history knew about um, these they call them Amazons. I don't really like that term, you know, um, but these were, this is a powerful tradition, a powerful African tradition that was continued by UNIA. Yes, the act of making war, as that occurred in various um, parts of the Mau Mau um, rebellion, and women's engagement in the act of making war with men, um, in that case, they specifically were not using weapons but their bodies. And I think it's very important to understand that women in the UNIA put their bodies on the line. When women parade in Harlem, New York, when they parade in Alabama, when they parade in Virginia, when they have these drills after church on Sundays in Miami, right, in, in Colorado, <laughs> I found Denver, Colorado, BCN arguing over how many bullets did they need to buy. Um, in New Orleans, okay, when these women put on the uniform and decide to go out to practice, they present themselves as, de as defenders and they become open targets. And they do it anyway. In the same way that the poets are signing their names at the end of the poems, knowing that they're being surveilled by the Bureau of Investigations, knowing that the newspaper has been banned by imperialist governments, they still participate, they still choose to do it. Why? Because what is at stake for them is so much more than what they believe they might endure. And in many cases, and I want to make sure I make this clear, in many cases they're doing this not to step on the toes of men or to get in the way of men or because men aren't doing it. They're doing it because as women, they're using their gender to sort of demonstrate and advocate on behalf of black men, in tangent with black men, and daring others, okay, so I'm a woman, and you are really going to do what, right? Things that black men would find themselves lynched for saying or doing in the United States, you find you and I, a women willing in Detroit, in Chicago, in California, in Los Angeles, willing to take that on and take that risk. And so that's how they make war, with and without the gun. OK. Um, we have a question from Annette Palmer. And she would like to know, what was the reaction of males in the community to the women corps? Um, there's actually the African Universal Legion, which was in partnership, again, the Efficient Womanhood Partnership model, uh, with the African Motor Corps. And it's the men actually training the women. It's um, former World War I 
soldiers training the UNIA women on how to shoot <laughs> and how to repair cars. And so the men are actually supporting this activity. Uh, CCGH PhD, she didn't give her name, so that's you know the, the name associated with her um, entry. She stated, um, true efficient womanhood status is the use of identities. Come through with the discussion on these women being in control of how they were perceived and using it to navigate or build upon their goals. And that is something that you talked about in your discussion in terms of how they identified, how they dressed, and that, you know, they, not because they dressed conservatively mean that they had conservative ideals, that they were very visionary in their objectives. Yes, definitely. And I, I think it's important to understand that in scripting their own identities, they actually then come to be the author of the Pan-Africanist politics that we see Amy Ashwood Garvey stand up in 1945 and usher in at the Pan-African Congress. That being able to say for themselves that marriage, for example, in the case of Mamie Demina and Henrietta Vinton Davis and Amy Ashwood, may not always work for you, okay? But that does not mean that you are now less public, less active, less valuable, because you are not attached or an appendage to a man. And, and really, in 1920s and the 1930s, the culture looked for a missus and a mister, or a reverend and a missus, right? And here is Amy Ashwood saying, okay, first of all, I invested in this name, so I'm not gonna give it up, <laughs> okay? Secondly, I helped to graft the ideology, so I'm invested in its success, so I will continue. Right? And this idea of reinvention and extension of self, the reinvention of Mamie Demina as a Jamaican citizen, who we thought was Nicaraguan, who was born in New Orleans, right? Um, the reinvention of self of Ethel True Dunlap, who made sure that her name was everywhere. We just don't get to take a picture because she wanted to maintain a certain identity. And so in their public persona, they are very specific and particular about how the script is shaped because they are authoring it and they author it in the Negro world. And so until people begin to understand that the Negro world is a valid primary source and probably more so than an edited volume or an excerpted book of clips, reading the Negro world from page to page because I'm nosy and I like gossip has inform the way in which I see the relationships between men and women in the organization change over time and recognize that efficient womanhood itself has changed over time. It has evolved. And had it not, we would not see Tarana Burke in the 21st century saying, my grandfather was a Garveyite and I still own a universal um, hymnal. And my Bible was a different kind of Bible because it referred to a African-centered cosmology. Do you think um, efficient womanhood is synonymous with feminism? This is a question from Kenja um, McRae. Thank you so much, Sister McRae. Um, I do not think that efficient womanhood is synonymous with feminism. I believe it is a form of black feminism but I believe that efficient womanhood is unique in that it has two aims, two goals that it engages simultaneously and refuses to have one sacrifice for the other. The nationalist aims of the UNIA women go in tandem with their gendered concerns. And so you cannot build a nation without the women as a part of that nation, as co conscriptors and conscribers and co-authors. Okay. Um, this is another um, question from Christy Garrison Harrison. Um, she says, this was an incredible talk. I salute the depth and nuance with which your research explores how these women constructed their own identities and use the perceptions of others as a navigation tool and to pursue their goals. It confers autonomy and self-awareness. 
this she wants to know if this recording it will be available and she would like of course with your permission if she could show it um, for her history of women class um, I give my permission but we would have to check with Liberty Hall um, sister Garrison as to um, the availability of sharing beyond their space but I believe that this video would be used for educational purposes mm -hmm. and so therefore under that guise yes okay and thank you for that <laughs> all right coming from Rena Goldtree um, I very much enjoyed the lecture and learned a great deal from Dr. Duncan's groundbreaking work here is my question. In your presentation, you mentioned that UNIA women were fully enfr enfranchised by the association's constitution and voted within the organization. How did UNIA women's political engagement within the organization shape their political activism, both locally and internationally? They gave trouble. <laughs> They really did give trouble. Um, on the local level, you find UNIA women um, taking on publicly elected officials in, in, one, in one case um, in New Orleans um, after the assassination of James Eason. Um, the persons who were arrested for that uh, crime, the women of the organization decided that they needed to form a particular committee and they came up with a name for themselves and signed a letter, signed their names, and addressed it to the sheriff, the governor, and the major uh, white newspapers of the era, threatening the sheriff that the seat in his office would not be cleaned well, should he not release the persons who they were holding, who the UNIA believed had nothing to do with James Eason's murder. Um, women in the organization through their Black Cross nurse meetings, the Universal African Motor Corps meetings, and the ladies division meetings actually discussed political candidates. Now, this is interesting because the UNIA purported to not be a political organization. It also purported to not be a religious organization. However, the political strategies employed by the membership were very much so informed by what they read in the Negro world. And so the Communist Party, the American Communist Party, and the American Socialist Party found an audience um, in the UNIA. And I believe that in many ways, when we see women running for office in New York City, women running for office in um, California, as is, was the case for um, Charlotte Bass, who ran for vice president, um, the support of Henrietta Vinton Davis for the Progressive Party uh, in the United States all emanates from the practice that they got in the UNIA circle and their understanding of the political structure and the value of the vote and what it could do for them as women and for their families through their participation in the UNIA spilled over into the general elections in their local areas. Thank you, Dr. Duncan. A special hello to Professor Rupert Lewis. Um, he is watching. And he actually made a comment and he said, very important lecture, opening new gender perspectives. And indeed it is. And I am saying that I'm actually heartbroken that I didn't learn these things in university. So I hope that this is the start for change. And this is important for not just our young women, our girls coming up, but also for our boys to respect um, the contributions. Um, this is a comment from Fofier, I think that's Carol Miller. Greetings, Nana. Timely presentation in a time and space where more matriarchal energy needs to be invoked to balance the overly patriarchal learning of our universe. All right. Patrice Allen would like to know what is your advice for young scholars, junior faculty, you know, master's students, PhDs, you know, of women in the UNIA? Thank you for that question. And my, my advice is really 
Simple. Follow the sources. While I am a trained historian and I respect historiography and I cite the scholars that have come before me, as you've noticed in my talk, I am alluding to the need for some correctives in the information that has been widely circulated over the past 30 years that has mislabeled, misnamed um, the work of UNIA women. And, and I want to stress that this is work, that this is not service, that this is a vocation that these women chose for themselves. And no, it doesn't have a paycheck. No, it doesn't have an insurance plan. No, there is no retirement. They had to raise money to put a, a grave marker um, for Henrietta Vinton Davis's grave in Washington, D.C. Um, they keep, uh, there are two universal African churches left in the United States, one in Alabama and one in Jacksonville, Florida, that has a Mother's Day for Laura Kofi in which they raise money to maintain her gravesite and ensure that the historical marker for Adorcaville is properly taken care of in Florida. And so one of the things that I think becomes important in, in, st in studying these women is to take the time to not only know about their public lives, but to understand how their private lives were intricately mixed into the public choices that they made and the effects of it. I also encourage people to go beyond edited volumes. And I think that the starting place for understanding the Universal Negro Improvement Association and finding the name of the person and where to look does begin with the Robert Hill Universal Negro Improvement Association papers. It's a starting point. However, I challenge you to go and read the newspapers that circulated in Panama, in Costa Rica, in the Panama Canal Zone, in South Africa, um, to go and read the newspapers in the United States, the Pittsburgh Courier, the Amsterdam News, um, and read the larger newspapers, the Chicago Sun, uh, the New York Times, um, and the Atlanta Constitution, to see what they had to say about the Garveyites, and then begin to weave the story together. You and I, a women, were a blended women. They did not segment themselves based on geographic location. They did not segment themselves based on education. They did not segment themselves based on social background. And so in many ways, I propose that we understand the language and the nomenclature of our profession and the frameworks that it presents, but then also evaluate these persons on their own terms on their own ground. And look at the language that they use. Efficient womanhood, the term, originated with a woman named Hannah Nichols in 1919. She issues a call from the floor of the um, New York uh, UNIA Liberty Hall, where she says, it is time for an efficient womanhood to come and defend the race. Now, this is in the midst of race riots in the United States, right? And lynchings are on an increase. And here is this woman from New Jersey, a law student nonetheless, right? Somebody who's supposed to advocate for law and order and civil obedience, saying to UNIA women, it is time for an efficient womanhood to come and defend the race. And the term efficient womanhood itself was actually a phrase that was used by W.E.B. Du Bois in an essay called The Damnation of Womanhood. And so there, in that essay, he defines efficient womanhood as the ability of black women to take the worst and make it the best. And in UNIA circles, what efficient womanhood came to mean was that they would exercise the exigencies of leadership, that they weren't going to wait for a protocol, a vote, or a, someone else to come and say, let's do it, but to recognize that in the moment that they were living in, there were things that needed to be done, and so they were willing to do them. And as scholars, we have to respect that. We cannot want everyone to fit the established paradigms and say, okay, well, if you don't, if you're not educated, if you don't belong to the Baptist Union, um, if you're not the wife of a resident, you didn't belong to the club movement, we don't know what to do with you. 
We do know what to do with you. We ask you, what did you call yourself? Hannah Nichols said, it's an efficient womanhood. And so, the efficient womanhood of the UNIA. Okay. Bear with us, we just have a couple more questions. Yes, um, all right, this is from Elise Mitchell. And she says, um, thank you to the ACIJ and Liberty Hall for hosting this wonderful event. Um, her question is, um, could you share more about the Black Cross Nurses concept of medical ethics? Who were their ethics inspired by? Was there any overlap between the women of the BCN and those in the Motor Corps? Thank you so much for that question. Um, there were women who belonged to the BCN and the Motor Corps, but they had a special designation or special title. Um, the ethics of the uh, Black Cross nurses uh, originated in part from the curriculums of nursing schools that would not admit black women in the 1920s, as well as the cultural mores and practices of African, African women globally. And so they used their own cultural practices and the agenda of the UNIA along with the standards um, of uh, the nursing profession to develop their ethics. And in this way, when they uh, completed their training and became diplomed nurses, they could then apply to be hired at city and state run hospitals because they actually had a manual, a book that showed that they had followed the curriculums of other trained nurses. Okay, um, and in terms of the overlap, the reason that many of the BCN and the Motor Corps um, are not one in the same, the women who were in the BCN that belonged to the Motor Corps um, essentially would, <laughs> don't laugh at me, but they were trained to be ambulance drivers, right? And so there is a division of labor and work that's assigned. Right, and so that's why you're not do, you're not shooting the gun and stitching them up after you shot them. Right, um, that's kind of hard to do, and so this is why they they actually have two separate auxiliaries. And the use of the word auxiliary is not to um, in their in their vernacular is not in any way to indicate a lesser than status than the African Legion, et cetera. But it is the name that the women chose for themselves and how they chose to describe their work because they saw themselves as an extension of the UNIA. And as an extension of the UNIA, they had the right to exist independently. So even when the UNIA was not fully functioning, you find that the BCN still exists in communities when there is no actual UNIA division um, intact. Thank you, Dr. Duncan. Um, Christy, Harrison, um, she adds, you know, to the point that you made that a vocation, it's not a service. And yes, to that key distinction, which is often overlooked, descriptors of women working or leading are often coached in the marginalizing terms. And then she has waving handkerchief. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. We have a question from um, Hervin Chung. And um, it states, it is perhaps time for the creation of a Marcus Garvey scholarship to supersede the Rhodes Scholarship within the African nation. What is your opinion on that, Dr. Duncan? The creation of a Marcus Garvey scholarship to exceed the Rhodes Scholarship within the African nations would be a worthwhile endeavor. Any space that we can establish that would promote um, and create uh, education opportunities for persons of the diaspora is a welcomed one. Um, I would actually uh, include a proviso in such a scholarship if we had anyone out there with the money to help us get started. Um, Brother Chung, you, you, know, you feel free to establish it and, and I'll make sure to click the link on the GoFundMe page. But I think a proviso should be that you are required to teach at a historically black college and university, 
that you are required to do scholarship and research that is relevant to the African diaspora and promoting an understanding of its global brilliance and expanse. I heartily agree. Concur to the fullest. Okay, so this is from me. Um, I noticed that you've, you've published on Mamie Demina and Henrietta Vinton Davis and Laura Kofi. Um, but I was particularly interested in um, Ethel True Dunlap, you know, because you described her as a mixed race woman who had been labeled by census as a white woman, but yet she identified as a woman of color. Do you think that really matters? I mean, does society have the right to construct your own personal identity? Well, in actuality, her father listed her as white mm -hmm. on the census. Her mother was deceased at the time when she was six years old at the um, recording of the first census um, that she's listed on. And I was unable to, to date, to locate records on her mother and her mother's family to establish if they were actually black. So Ethel Dunlap, when she, when she is born in Missouri and leaves Missouri to go to Chicago and happens to live in what is called the Black Belt of Chicago at the time and joins um, one of the more prominent black Baptist churches. And in that setting, she encounters Garveyism in, 19, in December of 1919, and then I find her membership card for Chicago in January of 1920. So she joins instantly, apparently. And I think that in researching her, um, she did have a daughter. She was married to a white man. And she lived in Los Angeles in an all-white neighborhood and had affiliation with Charlotte Bass, and so seemed to be living this Dual two life. life. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it gets sticky in wanting her, again, to fit one or the other paradigm. So you believe Does she it was matter? Passing? Yes. I don't believe that she was deliberately passing because she says, I'm white in color only. Mm -hmm. So she's not telling anyone that she's not white. And the brothers who are so impressed with how she looks and didn't take a picture to show me aren't asking her if she's white. They're assuming something about her. And I think in terms of what we now understand to be quote unquote allyship, Ethel True Dunlap presents us with a complicated model. Does that take away from the over 103 poems that she wrote in the Negro world, where she advocates for black autonomy, where she is a staunch um, Garveyite, where she chastises white people for their behavior? I don't believe so. In fact, I think that when we understand that UNIA women come to the organization and reinvent themselves, um, along the lines of the nationalist cause that we can only salute her for her daring. But it did trouble her in the end because essentially she is conflicted, right? And dies, I believe, unhappily and unsatisfied. There was um, a promise to her by Mr. Garvey directly of a publication of a collected volume of her work similar to what J.R. Casimir did with his work. Um, it did not come to fruition because the Universal uh, Publishing Press also, the, which was really the B publishing house in Harlem, uh, New York, went under before they had a chance to realize that activity. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. So when is your um, upcoming book? will be um, available. We, we, we anticipate this time next year. This time next year, you know, so you know we're all waiting with bated breath. And congratulations, you Thank know, you. For, for attempting it. Thank and, you. And hopefully we can get this as a core book here in Jamaica along with other parts of the African diaspora. Thank you. 
Well, that was the last of our questions. Again, we thank Dr. Duncan for her patience with all of our um, badgering in her mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now we will welcome Mr. Janke to do the acknowledgments and closing remarks. Thank you again. Today's activities would not have been possible without assistance and contributions from various persons. Consequently, we now are taking time out to acknowledge them. To Dr. Duncan, our guest presenter, we say a very special thank you. You never hesitated when we approached you with the request. We are also very grateful that you are so accommodating to come and do the presentation in person despite the threat of the COVID-19 pandemic. Your presentation, as you would have realized from the discussion and the questions that ensued, was quite informative and engaging. Thanks to Mr. Vivian Crawford for bringing greetings. We can always depend on you to support our efforts at Liberty Hall Legacy of Marcus Garvey. To Dr. Leslie Gale Atkinson Swaby, Thank you for agreeing to be our moderator today, and a very efficient moderator at that. Special thanks to Mr. Mark White and his team from Visual Tech Solutions for the professional and exemplary service provided as usual. Thanks to Dr. Cressa for your assistance with some of the technical logistics. Thanks to the Liberty Hall staff, I prefer to say the Liberty Hall team, for your hard work and effort in putting this event together, and thanks to the ACIJ JMB team for support. Finally, thanks to you, our online audience, without whom none of this would be possible. We are grateful that you took the time out to join us for this, our annual lecture in this format. We hope you found it to be relevant and informative. We are, we are ready to welcome your visit with us at Liberty Hall as soon as it is safe to do so. Feel free to contact us afterwards should you require additional information or clarification. Without the contributions of everyone mentioned, the 12th staging of our annual Marcus Garvey lecture would not have been possible. Thank you all and stay safe. As one last gesture, and as a token of our appreciation, um, we have a small token to present to, um, to Dr. Duncan, and I'll ask Leslie Gale to make that. Dr. Duncan, thank you for being here physically. You know, thank you for sharing your, your research and your passion. And we are so grateful for this lecture and all that you have taught us. And we wish you every success in your future um, research and publications. And you should seriously think about coming to Jamaica, to even as a research scholar, <laughs> to teach our next generation of students. Thank you. <laughs>